So this year, we're here to talk about the effect that the restrictive lingual frenulum and the release has on the fascia system. My name is Sarush Zaghi. I am uh, ENT. I, I, I trained out of uh, Harvard Medical School. I did my residency at uh, UCLA in ENT. And then I went on to do a fellowship at Stanford. Uh, since that time, I have been working as medical director of the Breathe Institute. And we are the first ENT clinic in the country which uses myofunctional therapy as the first line intervention for kids and adults with uh, sleep and breathing issues. In addition to the patient care that we provide, we're also really passionate about research and education. Uh, some of you may remember that we were here last year. Can we have a show of hands for who was at the conference here last year? Awesome. Fantastic. And uh, last year, I spoke about the evaluation, diagnosis, and treatment of freedom restrictions. We spoke about how to evaluate for tongue ties, lip ties, and buckle ties, and showed demonstrations and discussed how important it was to use pre- and post-operative myofunctional therapy. But we're always learning, and so I'm so grateful to have you guys here today to learn about our updates. So last year, I spoke about our data that we were just collecting on our 348 cases of lingual frenuloplasty with myofunctional therapy, our level three study, showing really high rates of patient satisfaction and treatment success and low risks of minor complications. I discussed with you guys our treatment approach, which includes pre and post-operative myofunctional therapy to help improve outcomes. As you can see on this, on this uh, diagram here, Traditional procedures without therapy and without the advanced techniques that we've demonstrated limited the amount of improvement that you'd get from these tongue tie releases. But by incorporating the myofunctional therapy protocol before and after, and with a modification of the surgical technique, we're able to get much, much better results. Not only revising prior cases, but getting it right the first time. Here's an 11-year-old girl with sleep disorder breathing and depressed mood. We do the release. And this is her the next day, making friends, doing better, sleeping better. Uh, for those of you who have seen my prior lectures, I've, I've maybe shown uh, Katerina's case. And you can see here that she had severe headaches, jaw tension, and sleep problems. She had already had a prior phrenectomy when she was seven, but it didn't make a huge difference. So we did her release, and you guys can see the videos uh, online on our website. And here she is two years later with a complete rejuvenation of her face, body, mind, and spirit. And perhaps one of the most interesting things that she discussed was a change in her posture. She discussed how prior she had a really forward head posture, but when the release happened, she felt like her posture was changing. She was able to hold her head differently. She was able to breathe easier. And that was really fascinating for us. But this is just one case. And so when I sent this to my colleagues, this is the kind of feedback that we got. I will be honest and say, I think you're better than what this one patient testimonial would suggest. Anecdotal experiences like this can form the basis of scientific evaluation, but just one report is pretty useless. Go back and try to do better, higher quality science than this. And as our movement started to get more traction, as more of you guys started doing the procedures and experiencing it on yourselves and through your patients, we started to get a lot of demand for it. A lot of Google entries and searches and local competitors took out AdWords with messages like this. Oral myofunctional therapy and funioplasty are not proven. There's no proven benefit to it. And there are, are almost no reputable ENTs doing this kind of work except one. And he mentions us. And he says that if you want to do this treatment, you can't do to the United States. You have to go to Brazil. That's the only place where they know what they're doing for myofunctional therapy. So what he's saying, he says it right here. There is no one in the United States. And, uh, and so what he's saying to his patients who come to see him is just do nothing. Myofunctional therapy is impossible. It doesn't work. This whole phrenectomy thing is made up. And we took a different approach. We said that if we look at it from a different perspective, if we work together, if we collaborate, we can do it because nothing is impossible when we work together. 
And with that, we were able to bring to publication, for the first time, level three evidence, 348 consecutive patients, for the first time demonstrating a role for myofunctional therapy and lingual frenuloplasty in the care of patients with mouth breathing, snoring, clenching and grinding, and also of a lot of interest was the changes to muscle tension. So the reason that we were doing these procedures was to help patients with restricted tongue mobility be able to do myofunctional therapy, but we had a different result that was totally unexpected. And that's that these, a lot of these patients would come and describe very odd, very strange changes that they felt in the chair. Changes like they could breathe better, that their posture was opening up, that their shoulders went back, that their feet were moving differently, their hands were feeling, feeling differently, and it was very, very interesting. And today's course is about understanding these effects that we're seeing on muscle tension and posture. And we have a great panel here that we've carefully put together to bring new material, new content, and new ideas so we can continue to push this field forward. And as we go into this, we're going to review how to look for tongue ties. We're going to share with you our latest research that is not yet published, but will be published next year. Um, but really, we have to recognize where this all comes from. And it really it comes from our patients and colleagues. And to that extent, before we go into the, the, the details of this, let's listen from some of our patients, OK? Because not just one or two patients. It's patient after patient after patient. And there's really so much you can learn by just listening to the feedback your patients give you. So let's spend a few minutes and listen to what people are saying, and then we're going to unravel it and answer why. So can we get the sound up? I'm going to pause it for a second. Is anyone from audiovisual here? Is anyone from audiovisual here? All right, we're just going to take a two minute break to sort this out. Thanks for your patience, guys. Should I test it again, Chad, or should I abort it? Should I test it again? If they can get it, if not, I'll bypass it. Anyone here from audiovisual? Yeah, are you able to get the sound up? Come up.
I can bypass it. I'm sorry. Yeah. Just a second transition of feeling the breath going through my body. All right. So we're starting. And can you guys keep the lights on? I see someone back there. All right. So we'll just we'll just kind of bypass it. Let's try this. was uh, my breathing when I didn't even realize that I, I was struggling to breathe. I, I, it was just a, such a transition of feeling the breath going through my body compared to how it was before. Very obviously noticeable. It's extremely relaxed. Like, like I almost just want to take a nap. Uh, tension has released my face, my head, and I feel really, really good. <laughs> and it was a complete and total release of tension pain and I feel comfortable and at ease in my own body and in my own skin in a way I never have before. I, I couldn't be happier. I feel I feel like I have more energy now, I'm more awake. My eyes it's easier to open my eyes. I had this tension here on my neck and all of a sudden I could move my neck, you know, better, you know, more range of motion on my neck. Mm -hmm. And as he kept on clipping the whole thing, it's amazing. It feels like there were like strings attached to somewhere and they got released. My neck before, my neck was tensing up, um, I mean, to the point where I could see the tendons, other people could see the tendons popping out of my neck and that's, you know, completely gone, basically. Already I can tell that I can breathe so much easier. I can speak a lot easier. I feel like I just am more relaxed. I'm so relieved to be finding answers. I'm thankful for the work that the doctor is doing and excited to get the word out because I feel like there's so many people who are suffering for nothing with the wrong diagnosis. Mine was so bad that I had to have it done in two stages. I've already had the first done and the release was so incredible because it took away, in fact you can still see when I do this, see this, this pulling, before it was all webbing, and it, it took it away. We came here as well to Dr. Zaghi because she would pocket her food all the time. It would take her at least two, one to two minutes for her to swallow um, each uh, bite. But I realized um, on the first day of the surgery, she ate everything like so fast as if she had no problems at all. Um, and that was like really fascinating for us to see because we've never, we haven't seen that for a long time. Actually, we've never seen her do that. Every action for the last, as long as I can remember, 25 years has required willpower. All of a sudden, post-surgery, bleeding, <laughs> full of gauze, traveling, and having had no sleep the night before, I had an infusion of natural energy which has not gone away. The release was so, it took my body at least a week to get used to it. In fact, the next week, I kept forgetting what day it was. It was so disorienting to me, but it was in a good way. It was like I was on Hawaii. It was the same feeling that I get when I'm in Hawaii, where I forget what day it is. So this is a nine month uh, follow up, and we just got his uh, sleep study results. It shows an apnea hypopnea index of 2.3 events per hour meaning that you no longer have sleep apnea. So, yay! Yay! Congratulations yes. to you. No more need for oral appliance. Okay. So tell us some of your thoughts. Uh, I'm just amazed that with our work together and the surgery on my tongue, at my age to be cured of something, uh, yeah, I'm so, I'm so excited. I'm just ecstatic. Yeah. <laughs> And so we really couldn't do it without all of you guys and without all our patients who uh, are trusting us. Uh, and so as we're writing up the, the paper, it took, it took some time. Uh, we went through 20 different revisions. Okay? Uh, we consulted with many of the people here in our audience. We wanted to make sure that it represents the work that you guys are doing in your communities. And so this paper is now published in a prestigious ENT journal, uh, Investigative Laryngoscope. We did make it open access so that you can freely share it, okay? And uh, it also comes with a set of guidelines, 10 guidelines, and among those guidelines is the encouragement and perhaps the requirement 
to work together in interdisciplinary teams for pre- and post-operative myofunctional therapy, but also body work. So if you guys are looking for a reference or a resource that's saying the way to do it is by working together, this is the paper that, that we've prepared. And so uh, the paper finally got accepted for publication on July 9th, 2019. This was a work of about three years. And already we're learning so much more and taking it further. We're thrilled by the amazing network that we have. So make sure to follow us uh, either on, on, find us on Facebook, uh, through Zagi MD or through the Breathe Institute. And we'll put out the latest research for you guys. Any new lectures we, we, we develop, uh, any new content. And we're thrilled about the number of people we've been able to reach with this article. 76,000 individual people have seen this article. And we had 20,000 engagement. And thanks to you guys, 360 shares. So this is the way that we're going to affect our communities. It's by us putting out the content. But you guys here in the audience, reposting it and resharing it. I see people here taking videos of the content. And I encourage you. Get the message out there. Let's work together. Let's hear from each other. And so uh, when I got this on July 9th, I was over ecstatic. 20 revisions, OK? Back and forth from the journal editors and from colleagues. And I got congratulations. Congratulations from all the different co-authors here. All of them except one. And that's Dr. Christian Guimino, who was our mentor and was the pioneer behind the study, who actually passed away on the very day that this article was published. And so if, for those who may not realize it, Dr. Guimino is an incredible pioneer for the entire field of sleep medicine. He developed the terms obstructive sleep apnea. He developed the term upper airway resistant syndrome. He was founder of the journal Sleep. And you can see all the accolades that he's had for his work in obstructive sleep apnea. And you know what he's been working on for the past 10 years, often at the chagrin of the rest of the medical community? He's working on tongue ties and how we can identify early risk factors that lead to the development of sleep disorder breathing and what we can do by working together in interdisciplinary teams with myofunctional therapists and dentists and orthodontists to prevent these things before they occur. So in all honesty, I went to Stanford to learn how to do MMA surgery. I thought I was going to go there and be the world's greatest surgeon, do these huge surgeries to reconstruct the airways for people with sleep apnea. But I have to hand it to my mentor, Dr. Liu, because during his clinics, when we would be there planning MMA surgeries, the movements we're going to take, the rotations, Dr. Guillaumino would come in, and he'd bring little kids into the office, interrupt our planning sessions, interrupt our post-ops with MMA patients to say, I have an emergency. This kid has a tongue tie. <laughs> and we were stunned. I was like, are you, are you kidding me? But we both realized what's going on in this guy's mind. And if Dr. Guy Minot says that there's something to this tongue tie, we're going to do it. So before we would do our MMA surgeries, our complex surgeries, first case of the morning, tongue tie. And we were so impressed by the results that we saw. People were tolerating their CPAPs better, breathing easier. It was astonishing. Our tongue tie patients were doing better than some of our MMA patients. And so then I volunteered to help him with the research project. And this is the research project uh, in which we explored the restrictive lingual frenulum as a phenotype, as a type of sleep disordered breathing. We took 150 patients with sleep apnea. Half of them with short frenulums, restrictive tongue ties, and the other half without. And we examined them for their tonsil size, malampati tongue position, and whether or not they had a high arch palate. And again, we were shocked. The kids with the tongue ties, it wasn't just tongue tie. They had high arch palates. And from there, 
we went to do another study. Is it possible that the tongue tie has something to do with development of the maxillary arch? We would come to meetings like this and professionals in the communities who've known this for 15 or 20 years. But if you look in the literature, there was nothing to find. So we went ahead and assessed whether there was a correlation between restricted tongue mobility and the V-shaped maxillary arch. And we looked at 302 consecutive subjects in an orthodontic practice. Let's see. Maybe the ones who are tongue-tied have dental crowding issues. And that's exactly what we found. We found that if they have these grade three and four tongue ties, there was a clear difference in how U-shaped versus V-shaped these patients were. And we learned by talking to our colleagues, by coming to meetings like this, that the tongue plays an immense role in the way that the palate develops. When the tongue is up, you'll get a nice, broad, U-shaped arch. But when the tongue is down, either because of tongue tie, or because of mouth breathing, or because of low tone, you don't have that natural palate expander, and you grow narrow. And I have to put a caution. It's not only tongue tie that causes this problem. Tongue tie actually only accounts for about 7.6% of the variance. That means that tongue tie counts for less than 10% of the reason why you get high arch palate. There are many other factors as well, including mouth breathing, tone, nutrition, swallowing, environment, a lot of the other things we're hearing in this conference. But we are learning that the tongue plays an important role as a scaffold for the maxillary arch. When the tongue is up, the teeth will come in around it. But when the tongue is down, either because of tongue tie, or because of mouth breathing, or because of low tone, or because of postural issues that force the tongue in a down position, or because of fascial restrictions from prior trauma, the tongue is dis dysfunctional as a scaffold, and it's not able to do its job, and the lips and cheeks win the fight, and you develop a reverse swallow pattern, and you get this high arch palate. And you get dental crowding. And for the first time, we have evidence that if you have a low tongue position, you're going to develop a high arch palate. And that's not where the story ends, that's where the story begins. Because the roof of the mouth is the floor of the nose. And if you have a narrow roof of the mouth, you're going to have a narrow nose. And so what does that do? It makes it more difficult for you to breathe through your nose. And what does that do for your tongue posture? Mouth breathing, more low tongue posture. And now you have a cycle that, in honor of Dr. Guillaumino, is being called the Guillaumino musculoskeletal hypothesis. And this is in the literature. And so this hypothesis says that there's something, something, inflammation, gut health, vitamin D, postural maladaptations, abnormal oral facial growth, something that we're learning about in the other sessions at this conference, something that leads to mouth breathing and low tongue posture, that mouth breathing is going to produce local inflammation. The inflammation causes the tonsils to become enlarged, the adenoids to become enlarged, which causes more difficulty with nasal breathing, which causes more mouth breathing, abnormal oral facial growth, and so on in this cycle. And some will say there's no evidence for this. There's no evidence. So let me show you this little kid who was born with a posterior tongue tie. And the mothers knew that there was something wrong right when she was 24 hours old. You can see the low tongue position. The tongue's not getting up. And we can follow this child and their journey as it goes from 24 hours old to six years old. Mom knows there's something wrong. She doesn't know what, but she knows it's not normal for her daughter to be choking at one day of life. 
with difficulty in the breastfeeding, lips apart posture at times. And so I'll, I'll play it forward a little bit. Here she's at six months. Just a little bit of mouth breathing, just a little bit of noisy breathing, and here she is. And if she did a sleep study, it wouldn't show apnea yet, just snoring. So even this doesn't get treated some of the time. Mom knows something's wrong. Because she's breathing and there's no apnea. So it goes on, and now you're starting to develop his apnea, those hypopneas, those flow restrictions. She tries to compensate for it by different postural adaptations, tossing and turning. You can see the bags under her eyes, and now she's having the apnea. Six, seven years old now. All right, so now, now, only now will her sleep study turn out positive after all this time. And only now are the tonsils and adenoids enlarged, with no surprise. So you can remove these tonsils and adenoids, and you've maybe helped the problem, but you didn't get to the underlying cause. And so when I talk about sleep disorder breathing, we talk about a domino effect because these symptoms are dynamic. It's the mouth breathing that leads to the noisy breathing, that leads to the snoring, that leads to the apnea. By the time you're at sleep apnea, in some sense, you're already too late. When you're nasal breathing, the tongue is going to be on the roof of the mouth. Try it yourself. Put your tongue up. The only way to breathe is through your nose. But if the tongue is down, you're going to be a mixed nose and mouth breather. And then your nose gets dry, and the tongue pressure drops in children with mouth breathing behavior. So now the tongue gets weak, and now you can't even lift up your tongue anymore. And now you're going to be more of a mouth breather, and then you get that posture change that comes with mouth breathing. So we understand that the tongue has to be up on the roof of the mouth. And we're learning from our colleagues that sometimes it's tongue tie and sometimes it's other issues, physical therapy issues. Michelle Emmanuel was describing to us yesterday that there are things you can do in two and three year olds or even babies at birth, like massaging the floor of mouth and different maneuvers you can do with the neck and tummy time methods to strengthen the, the, the core that can help these kids early on because it's all interrelated. When the tongue is up, you're going to have a nice, wide, open airway. But when the tongue is down, you're going to have mixed nose and mouth breathing. And when you fall asleep with the tongue in a down position, you're going to have a narrowing there that's going to contribute to snoring and eventually sleep apnea. But more than that, you need to have your tongue up on the palate to grow the jaws. So you have this cycle. And this is the cycle, the guillaume musculoskeletal hypothesis, the cycle of why we believe sleep apnea develops. Tongue should be up. And this is what we want to see in our kids. Sometimes it's tongue tie, but sometimes it's other things. And to figure out those other things, we have to work with our therapist, our speech therapist, our myofunctional therapist, our physical therapist, our occupational therapist, to sort it out. Because tongue tie only accounts for about 7% of the reason for why these things develop. And that's why we're all in this room today. So we can learn across different disciplines what we can do besides surgery for these problems. I'll first talk about surgery this morning and when it's indicated, and then we'll start to understand when it's not. And then Sandra's gonna talk about the fascia system, 
And then we're going to have our other colleagues, uh, Dr. Hushka and Hinden, talk about what we can do from a physical therapy perspective. If you have a tongue tie, you're not going to be able to get your tongue up to the roof of the mouth. And that's going to precipitate everything that we've learned with the low tongue posture. If your goal is to get the tongue up to the palate, what can you do? Well, myofunctional therapy. Okay. This is going to be the safest and most effective way to get that tongue up. I have seen some tongue ties release with just therapy alone. I have seen fascial restrictions improve with just therapy alone. So we always start with therapy because it might be all you need. And even if it's not all you need, we now know with good evidence that that therapy is going to improve the results of your surgery. So there's really almost no circumstance that you won't do some kind of therapy. If you can't do myofunctional therapy, well then you'll do body work and you do those manipulations and occupational therapy or something to see if you can get around the issue. Because tongue tie only accounts for 10% of the reason for why they're doing that. It's the adaptations and the, and the dysfunctional habits that develop that are perpetuating it. Myofunctional therapy looks to <coughs> establish exclusive nasal breathing, strengthen and tone the, the tongue and oral facial complex, promote ideal resting oral posture, among others. And the best therapy is individualized for that patient. You're figuring out what does this patient need and you deliver that. It's been shown to help improve the severity of obstructive sleep apnea by 50% in adults and 62% in children with improvements to daytime sleepiness and snoring in children and adults of all ages with no side effects no harm, no risk. It improves adherence to CPAP. And why is that? How can CPAP work when the tongue flops back and blocks the airway? Myofunctional therapy gets the tongue out of the throat and up into the roof of the mouth. So you can have that nasal breathing and the CPAP can be more effective. And there are now reviews in Nature and Science of Sleep that is accepting the role of myofunctional therapy in improving CPAP compliance, modulating the severity of sleep apnea, and even prevention in children. But if they have a tongue tie, how are they going to get their tongue up? How are they going to do the therapy? And so we see this little girl with a grade four tongue tie, class three malocclusion, who has noisy breathing. She's sleeping with her tongue down, her mouth open, and she can't sleep on her back because if she did, the tongue would flop back, so she sleeps on her side. So we do the procedure, we offer the treatment with myofunctional therapy before and after, and this is what you get. Quiet, lips together, nasal breathing. And if you go on our website, you can see the whole video where the mother is astonished at how she's just sleeping on her back and she's not restless and tossing and turning across the bed. And we're proud to say that this case is actually published with the videos, open access, and that's going to be one of our goals to the Breathe Institute, that everything that we publish, we're going to publish as open access so that you guys can distribute it and share it because that's what we want for this work. That uh, this treatment can really help. Sometimes tongue ties are obvious, and other times they're not so obvious. And this is one of the biggest challenges. When do you know? I hope that everyone here would agree, yes, that this is a tongue tie. But this is also a tongue tie. And so is this. Traditionally, the way to measure tongue ties is based on the Kotlow free tongue measurement. If you send a patient to your local ENT, primary care doctor, dentist, this is the criteria that we're taught to use. This is what's in our board exams for determining whether or not there's a, there's a tongue tie. You measure the length of the tongue from the tip to the insertion of the frenulum. This is called the Kotlow free tongue length. And if this number is more than 16 millimeters, you're in the clinically normal range. So yes, we agree that this is a severe tongue tie. But this one, how is this child going to get their tongue on the roof of the mouth. How is this child going to have exclusive nasal breathing? You take a look at this gentleman with severe sleep apnea, inadequately treated with CPAP. 
his cotlow free tongue length is more than 16 millimeters. But we can all see that he has a string here that's limiting the mobility of his tongue. So how do we quantify this? We first have to start by appreciating that the structural definition isn't enough. We have to have a functional definition which characterizes not the structure that we're seeing, but the function that we're observing. And through our research, we're finding these patients are tolerating CPAP better because now they can get their tongue in the roof of the mouth. And we're doing ongoing studies that we wish to have present to you next year on patients who have sleep apnea pre, with pre and post-operative sleep studies and CT scans. And this is one of the patients from that study showing that his apnea hypopnea index improves from 30 down to 18.2. We know that these issues are multifactorial, multidisciplinary. These patients also have limitations in their jaw structure, but it's a start and we're getting there. But the first thing to do is to figure out who we're going to include in these studies. And so that's why we're spending a lot of time learning to identify these patients and measure them in reproducible fashion. And so the tool that we're using is the tongue range of motion ratio. This assesses the extent to which you can lift your tongue relative to your mouth opening. So you measure the internecisal mouth opening, and in this case it's about 50, and then you have the patient lift up their tongue up to the front teeth. And in this case, the patient is able to lift up the tongue 76% of the maximum mouth opening. And we consider more than 50% to be above average. Less than 50% below average, bottom 25th percentile, and less than 25% as a 10th percentile. And we can say, using this grading scale, that these patients are definitely going to have a problem. These patients are probably going to have a problem. These patients might have a problem. These patients are unlikely to have a problem. But this grading scale in and of itself isn't going to tell you if they're tongue tied or not. Because it's not only if they can get the front of the tongue up, like in this case, but whether or not you can get the back of the tongue up. And this is called the lingual palatal suction, suction hold, or cave. Now the question is, what's a normal range for the cave? What's a normal range? How much should you open? And so we'll be publishing, and for the first time I'll be demonstrating uh, data from 600 patients from the Ferris study led by Cynthia Peterson and myself with approximate ranges. Because we go from restricted to unrestricted. But what's normal? What measurements should you be getting? And this is what we'll be publishing. Okay? This is 600 patients of all ages. And What's the average? What's the average that you would be able to open your mouth, comfortable mouth opening? What's the average that you'll be able to open your mouth and lift your tongue up? This made number is maximum active internecisal distance. So about 60% is the average for lifting the front of the tongue up. 40% is average for the suction hold. These are just ranges. It's not going to tell you for sure, but it helps you start that discussion and it helps you understand whether the patient in front of you, how that patient compares to the, natural, the, to the normal population. So in this case of this patient, his mouth opening is really large. Okay? We kind of take that as a note. Compared to everyone else, he has a very big mouth opening. The amount of free tongue that he has, the amount of lift that he has, this is above average. But his, his suction is very poor. And his tongue lift relative to his mouth opening is low, and so is his suction ratio. And we do the procedure, and afterwards, everything is where it should. Okay? And so people ask, why do you compare to mouth opening? Why not just take the raw measurement? Why are you doing the ratio, which is this number divided by the mouth opening? And the answer is, is that. Everyone's jaw size, tongue size is going to differ based on two factors, their age and their size. 
And so this graph shows that as the patient's age increases, their, their mouth opening increases, and so do all these tongue measurements, and the same for height. So that's why we take a ratio. And so we can break it down to a simple graph like this, where if you're in the three and four category, you're definitely going to be affected. But if you're in the one and two category, there's no free pass. You still might be affected. You just have to look a little bit more carefully because other factors should be considered. And the factors that should be considered the most, perhaps, are compensation patterns. Because in a lot of these patients, what we see Gordon, is that they're able to okay. lift up their tongue, stick out your tongue for us. but they do it at the expense lift up your of the floor of mouth. Okay. Lift up sometimes the front two teeth. So she's lifting okay. up so her tongue. So you can tongue. see that it looks like a grade two uh, tongue mobility, but really she's bringing up her entire floor of the mouth. And if we hold her floor of mouth down, where it should be, and ask her to lift up, you can see she can't get it up. She just cannot get up her tongue. And you see the dimple right here that reflects the side of the frenulum attachment point. And so you can see how complex research in this area is because it's such an interconnected system. There are two ways of lifting up the tongue. You can lift up the tongue just using the tongue muscles, or you can push it up using the floor of mouth and the neck. And in a lot of our patients, because tongue movements are so essential to speech and swallow, when they can't lift it up, they develop compensations. And you have to control for those compensations to see the real problem. And we're finding that this technique of controlling for the floor of mouth compensation can unveil some of the cases that elude us. And uh, here's her pre and post-operative sleep studies. Her AHI drops from about 26 down to 9.2. How about this guy? He's lifting up his tongue more than 50%. So he should be in the normal range. But we can see that it's very tight. Even his suctions are more than the 40% marker that we said. But we can see that it's tight and that it's anchored. It's something's pulling it down. And that even to get here, he's compensating. Can I lift up your tongue? And when we control for that floor of mouth compensation, Relax it down. we can see that he's not lifting it with his tongue, but rather with his neck and floor of mouth. You guys see that here? Okay. And so we come with so another classification, which is the compensated, grade three compensating a grade two. And now we're taking it one step further, because you can see these on CT scans, and we're doing studies out of the Breathe Institute, looking at what markers can you find on a sleep study that suggests a tongue tie. And so this is a sagittal image. This is a tongue right here and this is the airway, and this is the spine. And we can see that this is the roof of the mouth, and notably, we have air separating the roof of the mouth from the tongue. The tongue is physically held down right there. Do you guys see that? So the only way you can get his tongue up is by pushing up from here. So we do the release. You can see the incredible difference in the mobility, no longer anchored down, and what's more incredible, is the objective data that we have that his tongue posture is different on the CT scan. Instead of being down, the tongue is now up, and it's there naturally. When the tongue is up, it's going to be out of the airway. When the tongue is down, it's going to obstruct the airway. And so people ask me, well, show me an example of normal tongue mobility. And so here's a normal examination. And now we're going to demonstrate an example of ideal or normal tongue mobility, and we have our tongue model here, Jen. So Jen, go ahead and open your mouth as wide as you can without pain or discomfort. Mm -hmm. All right, now lift up your tongue up to the front two teeth. Very good. Now suction up for me. Show me your cave. Excellent. We don't really see any compensations here, but if we want to control for them, we can use this groove director. And so go ahead and open up your mouth. And I'm just holding down on the floor of mouth here and noticing that it's not restricting the mobility of the tongue. Very, very good, and show me your cave. Okay, and again, we're seeing it's not lifting up the floor of the mouth in this example. Okay, and so the key numbers that you want, again, are more than 50% and more than 30% without compensation. More than 50% tongue lift and more than 30% suction 
without compensation. Okay. And so we discussed our research and the amazing success that we had. But what's more important than the success that we have is the learning opportunities. Because while there are many patients who are satisfied, there are many who are dissatisfied. While there are many patients who improve their quality of life after having these procedures, there are many who are neutral or frankly somewhat worse. And it's important that our patients are aware that if you do these procedures, even in the best of hands, you're going to have improvement to your tongue mobility 96.5%. So there's still a 3.5% chance that your tongue mobility won't improve. That you'll have some kind of complication, either scarring or bleeding or salivary gland injury. And so that's why therapy becomes all that much more attractive. Because therapy is not going to have any side effects or consequences. For the first time, we have good level evidence showing that these things work. But we're not done. Because we have to figure out the cases in which they don't work. And here's an example of that. 60-year-old female with worse sleep apnea after frenuloplasty. Her AHI started out at 17. She's having that floor of mouth elevation that I talked to you guys about. Afterwards, no more or less floor of mouth elevation, but her AHI goes from 17 to 56. Not the direction that we want to go. And when we were studying these cases carefully, going back, asking them to come in, do CT scans, or even trying to hash up the ones that they had pre-op, we noticed a common factor, that these patients with poor results have a narrow posterior airway space. Their tongue, it's not that their tongue is on a leash, it's that their tongue is in a cage. And that cage is the jaw structures here. And releasing the leash when the cage is too small sometimes doesn't help and sometimes makes them worse. The best patients are those with space here on their CT scans. But this is going to be affected by the way the CT scan is taken, their posture, whether they're swallowing. And so we're doing studies out of the Breathe Institute looking to uh, come up with standardized protocols for what you should be telling your patients. In general, what we're working on right now is natural head position, just however they present, instead of neutral head position where, where, your, where your ears are lined up with your shoulders, natural head position, natural tongue posture. So you're not really affecting them, not telling them to keep your tongue up. Put your head where it naturally wants to go, put your tongue where it naturally wants to go, and that's how we're doing the studies for now. And we can see that these patients have low tongue posture. And if you see this on a scan, whether you're looking for tongue tie or not, look for it. Because sometimes you'll see that tongue tie, and this can be a huge clue that can help your case. We are assessing different features on these CT scans. We now have a protocol if you guys use beam readers. If you ask for the Dr. Zaghi protocol or the Breathe Institute protocol, they will do the exact measurements that we're doing in our clinic so that you can build off of this. And they will provide you with a measurement, or you can take it yourself, of the posterior airway space at the hypopharynx, tongue, palate, retromaxillary. And we want these numbers in the ideal candidates to be about one centimeter. Okay? So this is what we would like to see ideally. The tongue up and about one centimeter. But we also know that the position of the spine has a lot to do with these numbers. And when you tilt your head up, it's going to improve these numbers. And when you tilt your head down, it's going to affect these numbers. So we're also taking a look at that. Because in this circumstance, the patient has one centimeter but he's in the CPR hold here. The jaw tilt, head chin lift. And so this is his natural head posture, up. But these patients can't go around looking up, so they bring their head forward. And now they have tension here. And now you can understand the role of the physical therapy and how having an airway issue can affect your posture and it can affect the way that you feel. This patient would be considered a better candidate, about one centimeter here, and there's space for the tongue. How about this patient? Is this patient a good candidate for tongue tie surgery? Anyone say yes, show of hands? Anyone say no? 
The answer is going to be no. She only has a three millimeter airway here. And this is with the compensation. So she's compensating to a three millimeter airway. When you look at her, she's like out right here. Okay? So these, candidates, these patients, is, the answer is not going to be tongue tie. It's going to be something else. So we'll say no here. Okay? And this is the kind of research work that we're doing. We're giving a preview of what's, of what's to come, what kind of stuff you're going to see out in the literature. So make sure to stay tuned and follow us so we can kind of update you as it comes along. There are different ways of doing the procedure. You can use a laser and you can use scissors. My preferred technique is the scissors, but I'm working with different laser companies to come up with different hand pieces that approximate the work of the scissors. Okay? So we're open to however the procedure is being done. The laser is usually an easier technique. There's less risk of bleeding, but it gives you a false sense of security. Uh, the scissors technique does require more advanced surgical skill. You get a better visualization of the anatomy, and you can get deeper releases. But it's just a tool. What's more important is the technique, and that's what we teach in our courses, in which we have different doctors come in, offer a three-day course where we go into at depth how to identify the patients, how to do the releases, whether you're using scissors or, or laser. Uh, whether you use sutures to get that first intention closed wound or you don't use sutures and you're getting healing by second intention. And uh, uh, both techniques work. It's just a matter of knowing how to manage those cases. A lot of uh, people talk about anterior versus posterior tongue tie. Yes, please. Does the type of laser matter? Uh, uh, we know that diode lasers are not going to be uh, good and also cautery. And that's pretty well accepted in the community uh, because you don't want to cause heat injury. So if you have a diode or a um, uh, cautery, we discourage that on the muscle or fascial tissues. Most other lasers are going to be uh, in, the, in, the, in the good working range. The one that we prefer the most is a CO2 laser. Uh, right. So anterior versus posterior ties. Okay. Uh, and there's a lot of discussion about this. So Dr. Gahiri describes the anterior ties being the mucosal frenulum and the posterior tie being just the fascia behind it. Our language of the Breathe Institute is a little bit different. We talk about anterior tongue mobility and we talk about posterior tongue mobility with the suction hole. And that's how we approach it. And when we're talking about this, instead of saying is it anterior or posterior, we say is it mucosal, is it fascial, or is it muscular? And uh, sometimes we have to get into the muscle tissue. And when we do that, it's beyond just a regular phrenectomy. We're actually doing a partial genioglossectomy because there are muscle fibers that are connect, that are overly adhering that tongue towards the floor of the mouth. Traditionally, okay, this is a great article by Nikki Mills. The lingual frenulum is described as mucosa and fascia. Always, that's it. If you have a tongue tie, it's mucosa and fascia anterior and posterior. But through cadaver dissections recently, we're learning that there's a lot of variation. Yes, sometimes it's just mucosal, just the red. Sometimes it's mucosal and fascial. And sometimes it's mucosal, fascial, and muscle fibers. And sometimes you can tell before you get in there, and sometimes you can't. And so if you were to come along and just cut through all the way, you could cause a lot of injury to the muscle fibers here. So in the technique that we describe, we go layer, you get that first layer, then you get that next layer, and when you're at the muscle, you go layer by layer by layer until this muscle drops down. And when this muscle drops down, you're releasing the fascia system, and that's when you see these incredible and profound changes right there in your chair, as we'll demonstrate in just a minute. Again, red here is mucosa, green is the fascia, and then you can see the muscle fibers. And there's a lot of variation out there in, in the patients that you'll see. So, okay. So here's the procedure. Close this one. We've already anesthetized it. I'm using a scissors and sutures approach. A little bit faster and we're going to go layer by layer. Okay? The, the first layer is going to be mucosa and a little bit of fascia. I'll make that cut through the mucosa. Okay? That's the mucosal cut and a little bit through the fascia. Close. But there's some more in there. You guys can see Good. that when she does her suction hole. Good. Open. 
lift up your tongue. That's a little tongue. bit more left to go. You see this here? So there's a restriction, okay? See how tight so this is in here? You can see it right here. It's there's a restriction. muscle adhered with fascia. So I'm going to grab it like that. So I dissect it out carefully. It's a good understanding of the underlying anatomy, making sure to avoid the lingual nerve, lingual vein, salivary gland tissue. There's the release. This nice, the release. obvious releases. Close. It just lets go. And now listen to the patient. Feel light here. Okay. Like that? She's feeling some lightness in her chest. That was She's the release. She's feeling okay. some lightness in her diaphragm. Crazy. She'll feel her hips <laughs> shift. She can even feel it down to her toes. And it's really incredible. Do you want the camera here still on? Oh, yeah. And so it, it, it's incredible when you see this in the chair. And we're going to show you what's going on. Here's what she looks like post-op day one. In this case, we did have to go through the fascia and into the muscle. Here's what she looks like two months post-op. When you have a tongue tie, okay, the tongue is going to be pulled down and tethered to the floor of the mouth. That's what it is. It's tethered oral tissue. That's what it's doing. So when the tongue is pulled forward, that's going to cause adjustments to the way that you hold your head and your neck. And if you hold it like that long enough, the fascia gets tight. And as that fascia gets tight, your whole body gets tight. Fascia covers all the muscles in the body. This little funny dance that we saw is the fascia network. Really good, smooth gliding when the fascia system is working well. But if you have a restrictive fascia system, it's like you're in a Spider-Man coat that's a little bit too tight for you. Okay? And we can learn about the effect of a restrictive oral fascia system by learning from our physical therapy partners. And here's a great video in which a demonstration is done by Dana Sterling on a Good. restrictive fascia. Today, system. Cody is Monsieur Fascia, okay? And I'm going to torture him and give him all sorts of fascial restrictions. Uh, now, before I do, Cody's fascia suit is healthy. And notice the cobwebs, right? They're doing well, right? So he can lift his arms, he can move, he can go hike, um, he can go play tennis. Yes, he can do it. He can tie his shoes, no pain. Okay, no problem. I'm about to change that. So I'm going to give Cody a myofascial restriction at his right rib cage and armpit. And if you can already see, he's already having to adapt a little bit against this. Good. So now, Cody, go ahead and try to lift both arms up for me. And we're going to just woo. Good. Okay. So can you see that his range of motion is restricted? Restricted right now. Really try to lift them up higher, Cody. Okay. Now, drop them back down because, ow, that's not fun. Now, this makes sense, right? You can imagine how this is going to create this restriction. Did you notice what happened at his left shoulder over here? Uh-huh, yeah? So go ahead, lift both of them again. A fascial restriction here is causing some serious range of motion issues over here. Now, let's drop that down, and I'm going to give him a fascial release and fix him up, and now, woohoo, yeah. Did you notice him kind of move his neck? That can, is not comfortable in the neck either. Just going to give you a brief example, a client that came to see us, fully torn rotator cuff. The surgeon said, sorry, can't repair it, fully torn. She now has that full range of motion and no more pain because we actually helped her modify her fascial restriction and she changed certain habits to not recreate it. So it's actually incredibly adaptive, okay? Your body is incredibly adaptive it does not rely on just one small little muscle, and there are even four little rotator cuff muscles if you create balance elsewhere. I'm gonna give another example, torture Cody some more, and this is a bit more of a complex example. So I'm gonna give Cody a pretty severe myofascial restriction at his right hip. Good. Now, first of all, can you see how Cody has started to kind of develop some interesting posture? Good. Cody, try to lift your arms for me, please. See where the restriction is? It's even worse than before, by the way. Did you notice that? 
and then drop the arms back down. Now, Cody's gonna attempt to walk with this myofascial restriction. So we're gonna go for a little walk, and he's gonna walk a little bit interestingly, right? Okay, and we're gonna back it up so we don't fall on Dr. Rock. Good, okay. So what I want you to see is that, first of all, you already saw how this affects his shoulders. Think about his neck. Can you imagine what might be happening at this hip over here? How that might be compensating and actually wearing on things, maybe even wearing cartilage from the position? Of course, this hip is probably not very happy and this knee could have serious problems. With this pattern, Cody can have plantar fasciitis on his left foot because it has to deal with severe loads and modified impact with every step to try to stabilize him. This is the interesting with fascia, where you think it is, it ain't, okay? And the other point is, can you imagine his lumbar spine? I dare anyone to go for a walk with this. Half an hour, tell me how your back feels. Okay, so I'll set Cody free, proverbially and literally. Thank you, Cody. Everybody, please give him a hand for being towards him. And that's an example of what we can learn by just listening to our colleagues from other disciplines. Because we're not the first ones to be dealing with trying to understand how to deal with fascial restrictions. Fascia covers all the muscles in the body. And there are actually fascial networks that extend from the head, and in fact, the tongue, all the way down to the toes. And this is the deep front line. And the deep front line is a fascial network that goes from the tongues to the diaphragm, into the hips, all the way down to the arches of the feet. So now, we're beginning to understand when we release these tongue ties, that we're engaging with the fascia system. And this is why their diaphragms are opening up, hip posture is changing. So what is fascia and why does it matter? We've partnered with Tim Timothy King, who's one of our instructors and affiliates of the Breathe Institute, so that he can provide us with more education and provide our colleagues with more information to learn in terms of what kind of physical therapy techniques our patients need. Technically, fascia is the connective tissue that provides a whole body, continuous, three-dimensional matrix of structural support. So that means it penetrates and surrounds all muscles, muscle bundles, muscle fibers, bones, nerves, and not to mention our internal organs. To put it another way, fascia is the biological fabric of the body. For the sake of this lecture, we're gonna use the word fascia in the more traditional medical sense to describe the sheets of connective tissue that are just under the skin, surrounding muscles, and groups of muscles. But what I really want you to take away from today is the fact that fascia is not just a connective tissue. It's a sensory organ that literally communicates to the central nervous system about whatever it is covering. Now, fascia has historically been ignored by research. It's been simply seen as a benign connective tissue that holds everything together. Throughout history, we'd study the body by breaking it into its component systems, and we still do today. But fascia was simply the connective tissue that surgeons would cut to get to the real organs. Now, some 50 years ago, a cardiac physician who served JFK in the White House, Jeanette Travell, observed consistent referred pain patterns from muscle. So her and her colleague, David Simons, invested 50 years of clinical observation into this phenomenon. The pain patterns that they observed are still today the most comprehensive charting of these poorly understood but incredibly common pain patterns. They titled their seminal work, Myofascial Pain and Dysfunction, the Trigger Point Manuals. And they identified localized fascial dysfunction that restricted movement and referred pain. Look, they were really ahead of their time in suspecting that the fascia had something to do with these incredibly common clinical symptoms. Now we have come a long way. In recent years, thanks to the dissectional studies by orthopedic surgeon Carla Stecco in Italy, and the clinical application of these observations by body workers like Thomas Myers, we've learned that fascia is not 
well, can not only cause local restriction and pain, like Travell observed, but fascia has global mechanical continuity and thus plays an essential role in posture and movement. So let's talk about the fascia that's most clinically relevant to us in our setting. There are multiple global fascial continuities, but we're going to focus today on the deep front line. The dissection that we're going to watch right here illustrates continuity, uh, that is forced transmission through epimysial and aponeurotic fascia from literally the toes to the tongue. So here we start with the foot, this is the uh, flexor digitorum longus, the deep posterior calf muscles and into the inner thigh and adductors. This is all connected fascially, it's continuous mechanically. Those adductors anchor into the hip flexors, iliopsoas, and we can see here uh, quadratus lumborum, and both these hip flexors and large lumbar muscles anchor into the crura of the diaphragm. And so there's this direct connection between respiratory, posture, and then the same uh, fascial continuity continues through the thorax, the anterior throat, the, uh, and the floor of the mouth, and indeed the tongue itself. In other words, there's a direct mechanical connection between orofacial function and tongue function and diaphragmatic breathing, lumbar and cervical spinal posture, gait, etc. And it really helps explain why Dr. Zaghi and other practitioners have often seen dramatic improvements in posture and posture related pain following frenuloplasty. Now fascia and skeletal and so we encourage you to come check out his website, Fast and Functional, uh, to, to learn more about uh, this uh, technique and material. And so now it's making sense why these patients are telling us about Okay, so this is Nadia. Nadia is an occupational therapist. So Nadia just got her tongue done, like, what, an hour ago or yes. something? And can you tell the doctors and speech pathologists and occupational therapists and everybody in the class, what did you notice happened different? Well, to begin with, when he started uh, clipping, um, I felt that, you know, I, I had this tension here on my neck. And all of a sudden, I could move my neck, you know, better, you know, more range of motion on my neck. Mm -hmm. And as he kept on clipping, the whole thing, it's amazing. It feels like there were like strings attached to somewhere and they got released. Mm -hmm. And even I was, I was telling um, Joy that I was parking my car and I could turn my head to, to do a three point, you know, and park. And before I had to basically lift myself and look to mm -hmm. give me more, more. Wow. Work. So it's very powerful. And also what you said about your breathing. My breathing. Like before, I, I, I had to kind of, I felt like I had to pull here in order to open my chest. And now I'm like relaxed and it just goes in. The air just goes in. It's, it's amazing. And I just had it done. All right. And now we're going to share with you a series of compilations of patient testimonials from their heads, shoulders, knees, all the way down to their toes. them it was like everything in my head and, and, and back opened up and so now you can see that the way that I hold myself is completely different this would have been impossible before the surgery the pressure in my jaw is gone the pressure in the back of my head is gone my dowager's hump which I had a really big one gone in one second flat um, after the first couple uh, releases I felt the sensation kind of go up the side of my face just kind of like a kind of like a release and then I don't feel like I'm crunched forward anymore. I feel like I can just kind of relax now. Um, I just don't feel as tense. Um, it was really weird and I felt it actually go down my back a little bit. Um, and I feel, I feel good. My quads feel looser and my, this area feels different. I don't feel looser, but it feels like it's moved. When we had started the procedure, my feet just sort of naturally had that, the right one was more or less vertical, but the left one 
tipped out to the side. And when the first release happened, there was this kind of wave of relaxation that went through my body, and my left leg just very naturally on its own tipped up to be parallel. And that just was sort of the, the, the new natural. Lift up your hand. Up. Swallow. I'm going to put pressure in your mouth. Is that okay? Yeah, it feels awesome. I feel great. You feel good? It feels like something just loose. Good. Great. But I want to continue. Is that okay? Yeah. It feels like it just released all the stiffness. And all the stiffness where? In my muscles and bones and body. Can you point to it where you felt the release? A little bit up here and here. Uh huh. And down on my thighs. Feels better? Yeah, it feels like something just got released and it feels like. It feels like. My. All my muscles just come down as something released. Everything just popping it down. That's a good feeling. Wow, that's amazing. So just imagine the impact that you can have uh, throughout their entire life soon. I want one. We do offer more learning opportunities. Uh, please visit our website. Please follow us online. Uh, we make uh, content freely available. And we also have course opportunities uh, in all aspects of uh, sleep and breathing um, for adults and infants through the Breathe Institute. Uh, here's one of our youngest participants in our course. Learning how to do tongue tie right. <laughs> you gotta get them early. <laughs> uh, if you want to learn more, uh, please join us at the Breathe course. Uh, we have a few dates left for, for this year, um, and we have more on, on ongoing. I also, before we end, I want to give a big acknowledgement to uh, the Breathe Institute, and I have my co-founders here and managing director, uh, Leili Noruz, uh, uh, Chad, Chad Knudsen, as well as Sandra Pinkerton. Uh, and uh, so, uh, we work together to uh, really advance the research and education in this area. It really takes a team approach, and I'm really gl gr uh, grateful to have uh, amazing partners like you guys. So thank you all for your interest and attention. And with that, I'd love to uh, take some questions as we welcome Sanda up, because she has some really amazing uh, content uh, that she's, that's never been uh, shared before uh, about the fascia system, and I encourage you guys all to stay up. So go ahead and change over, and I'll take any questions. Thank you. Are there any questions as we transition? Thank you. Yes. So I'll, I'll just summarize as, as, you're, as you're going on so people can hear. So she's saying that she's from the East Coast and she's put, trying to put together an interdisciplinary team of doctors uh, to help because that, that's what you need, right? You need to work together. To work with. Yes, please continue. Any cohesiveness, yes. So it's the ENT that he that she met. All they care about is the nose, and that's that's all that they see. That's the main thing that they see uh, is is the nose. And so the question is is how do we how do we work together? And really, it just starts by uh, awareness and education. And um, we're here to help through the Breathe Institute put out information. Uh, and so we just encourage them, bring them along to one of these conferences or to, or to one of our conferences, so that they can see. Once they see the connection. Um, it's going to be a lot easier for you to build that group. Yes? So my question is, what is your opinion about the nose and about surgery on the nose for this 
Yeah, and so we definitely uh, uh, explore that. Uh, so it all starts with breathing through the nose, but if you do over-aggressive surgery on the nose, you can get something called empty nose syndrome, uh, in which they're not able to perceive the flow of air. The other issue is that sometimes the nose gets congested because of mouth breathing. When you're mouth breathing, you're getting a lot of dry air into your lungs. The lungs are saying, hey, the air here is too dry. Moisten it up for me. And so the nasal cavity will give you more uh, congestion. You get turbinate hypertrophy. And so you really have to take a step back and look at the whole picture. So when we talk about nasal breathing, we always start with myofunctional therapy, lip taping, nasal saline rinse, exploring allergies, and then surgery, uh, only if really necessary for structural obstruction. But yeah, nasal patency is essential, but it's not the only thing. You ready? Okay. All right. We'll take more questions after. Thank you all very much. Thank you everyone for being here and thank you Dr. Zaghi for a wonderful presentation. Um, I'm here to share with you a couple of my findings in regarding fascia and uh, muscle and uh, my uh, oral myofunctional therapy. So today what I would, my goal it is for us to take it is to better understand how, how uh, my, uh, myofunctional therapy is uh, related to fascia, to appreciate how fascia impacts posture, facial development, and tongue structure, structure function, and mobility, and to identify collaborative partners we needed in order to provide the best care we can to our patients. So I just go over a very brief description of uh, a definition of orofacial myology. So it is a, a therapeutic approach addressing no uh, noxious oral habits like nail biting, thumb sucking, uh, lip licking, nasal breathing, resting posture of what? Of the tongue, of the lips, of the mandible, of the head and neck, chewing and swallowing patterns as a function, and functional speech patterning. So, oops, sorry, just give me a second. Put it either here. So I don't know about you, but um, in, my, in my training, when I took all this uh, anatomy and physiology classes, and then in dental hygiene, taking all the classes, the head uh, and neck anatomy, uh, the only thing I knew about fascia was like, uh, no, it was not even a paragraph. It was something like two lines stating that uh, fascia, it's a connective tissue. And that was it. And I never ever thought twice that was what it was. Um, and then here I am in my uh, profession facing patients asking me, what, what, what are you talking about? And um, my use the, use the way I communicate with my patient, it is I just want you to imagine I'm looking at a um, spider web. And the spider web, it has no starting, start, it has no ending. And it's a structure, holds the whole house of the spider. So is it taking to our anatomy? It is a, fa it's a biological fabric that actually holds us together to, uh, through the connective uh, uh, tissue network. So then the patient looks at me and says, so what is it? So that's, I say, well, that's a great question. So what is it? It's a tissue, it's an organ, it's a system. So now let's listen to Dr. Helen Langren, MD at Harvard, with her definition of what fascia is. 
Muscles are surrounded by an envelope of connective tissue, not only around the muscle, but also inside the muscle. Every single little muscle fiber has a little mini envelope of connective tissue around it. So the whole muscle is kind of invested in this multi-dimensional tube of mm -hmm. connective tissue. So that's one thing. But the connective tissue doesn't stop there. It goes between each muscle, so it transmits the force from one muscle to the muscle next to it. We used to think that the force that a muscle exerts goes mm -hmm. pulls on the tendon, yeah. right, and that pulls on the bone. Well, that's actually not the case. Uh, there's some really elegant recent research that's shown that a large component of the force that a muscle exerts goes laterally to the connective tissue around it and then to the muscles next door. It's distributed throughout the limb, very interestingly. And then the connective tissue wow doesn't just stop at the musculoskeletal system, it surrounds every single other part of the body, including veins, arteries, nerves, lymphatic vessels. Then it goes inside of organs, your heart, your liver, your lungs, your kidneys. Every single organ of your body has what we call a matrix of connective tissue. It's the scaffold. It's what makes the shape of the, whatever body part you're looking at. And it's a common denominator through the entire body. I mean, I find that's mind-blowing. You know, it's, it's really there everywhere. It's quite a definition, right? So let's just examine layer by layer what we are uh, talking about. So first of all, we understand there is a superficial layer, which is under the skin. And then there is another layer, the deep fascia. Now, that deep fascia also, we can be categorized in uh, epimesial and uh, aponeurotic fascia. That's how it looks under the microscope, and that's uh, important to understand to see how actually transfer from, from the epimesial to the perimesium, and you can see has that uh, honeycomb structure, and that is surrounding a bundle of fibers. And then connects a little further to the endomysium, which is enveloping every single fiber of our muscles, organ, and so on. That is under the microscope uh, view. And uh, what it's interesting to notice, it is that the blue, it is the soft form of fascia. And you see how it's actually, and on the right side, you do see the picture of the muscle, and you see how fascia layers are every, everywhere. So what I'm taking from this, it is that if fascia wouldn't be present there, the muscle would be just a big mush. And here it is the, uh, uh, the, um, soft part of the uh, structure of fascia, which is the hyaluronic acid. And in very common terminology, this is the, uh, the lubricant. This is what makes the fascia layers to slide. And if by any reason, and most of the time it's trauma, it gets stuck, that will be what makes the, the layers to be stuck. This is what is going to lead of, to compensation of the muscles, which we'll talk a little bit later about it. Another element I want to bring, and actually Dr. Zaghi was uh, touching on, it is about the uh, sensory uh, we, we found in the fascia. And they are uh, located in the perimesium. Oops. Okay, sorry about this. In the perimesium, right there. And they are neuromuscular spindle, which are transforming information. And all those information coming from our, inside of our body, we call them proprioceptors. And that is actually what gives us a sense of balance. That is what gives us the understanding how hard should we squeeze an egg because we want to hold the egg, but we don't want to break the egg. That gives us the balance. That gives us the understanding if we are having even closed or open eyes when we walk on an even uh, terrain. How do I put our, how do we uh, place our foot? How do we keep our balance? Now the interoceptors are, is all the information about the in, inside of our body. And it is, am I hot? Am I cold? Am I, um, hurting inside? Am I 
um, hungry. So those are the information provided still through the connection, uh, through Sur de Vasha. And here we do have an under microscope, so we can see, see how the right there we have the nerve endings of muscle spindles. So pretty much we discuss this about the multiplier, the multiple layers, the mechanoreceptors, which we can bring us to the understanding of the sense of proprioceptors. And here is Dr. Stephen Levin showing us what is biotensegrity, meaning which acts on the compression and tension notions, meaning the tension and compressions are bringing mobility to our body and they are functioning. So now, that made me to think about when I was a child, you having those stamp puppets, pretty much moving and showing how connecting, which was the string, was making our bones to move in different direction. That was just a joke. Okay. <laughs> so, um, Another point I want to consider, it is the role of trauma in fascia and muscle optimal balance. And that's extremely important and we are going to address a little more specifically in a little uh, later in the presentation. At this moment I want and I'm, um, uh, I want to present my gratitude to actually to my mentor, which happened not to be here, uh, which is uh, Valerie Singes. And uh, I, I was fortunate enough to meet her really early in my uh, career. And she was the one who shared everything she knew about fascia. And I, I was able to, to understand better, better how the body works. She still has gr great classes, so I encourage you to connect with her if you are interested in learning about, more about uh, fascia. Another great book, it is Fascia uh, by uh, David um, Lezonda, and uh, great resource, very easy to read and to understand what the fascia does and how it's functioning. So now, my mind was always curious to understand why, why, and why. And that takes me back to development. Why some babies are born with torticollis? Why do they, they keep their mouth open? Why, why, why? So I start looking at the developmental stages. And what I learned, actually, it is like in the two or third week, it's actually still in the embryo phase, the stage of blastula. Uh, the fascia start to develop in the mesodermic layer, right there. And that's why I found it so fascinating. It is that it is before any other organs in our body. So pretty much it's the base, base of structuring our whole body. And I found that finding extremely powerful. Then as you can see in the 12 weeks, the function of swallowing starts. And um, I want to share with you this graph just for you. It's a lot easier to visualize how it is. So two to three week, fascia layers start to, uh, fascia starts to develop, then heart and tongue. And 12 weeks is the swallowing function. And I want to share with you this video. Oh. Fire up. Yeah. Oh, is this a hand? Is that a hand? Yeah, the hands are a hand. Yeah, and then that's the head. Yeah, I saw the jaw moving. So that's what we were sucking on his hand, or it's just swollen. Oh my gosh, what did it go? The cord looks like it's in the way. Like, just grab it and play with it. <laughs> that'd, be, that'd be out of it.
Oh, look at that. <laughs> Roman still does that. You can see the swallowing, the suction. Now, based on those factors that, that we have learned, that the fascia develops on the two to three week of uh, after fertilization. Based on the fact that we learned that the baby starts to swallow and to suck their time possible from the 12, week, uh, 12 weeks. My hypothesis it is that compensation in the body can start even before birth. And I want to get more into learning and maybe we'll find some researchers interested in this subject and to learn actually what's going on and what's happening there. Now, uh, the next step we are going to explore it is the, how the fascia and muscles work, uh, are at work. And again, that was a journey for me because as you have seen in Dr. Zaghi's presentation, we have all those patients talking about miracle happened, okay? The neck doesn't hurt. And all of them, the common thing, they will put their hands around their neck and they will say, oh my God, the pain is gone. And then the toes, <laughs> okay? And, and then the shoulders. And all those signs which sounded so mysterious. So I said, I need to better understand what's going on. Why are they making so common claims and sounded like I'm talking about out of my mind, like, you know, I'm reading the coffee or something like this. And uh, so let's, let's look a little bit. First, let's understand the tongue. The tongue, as we know already, it's an organ. And it's an, ex an example of interrelation between structure, structure and function connecting the body's anterior part and the body posterior tongue. And this is uh, in, uh, through the, those muscle connecting to it the maxilla with the pharynx, larynx, cervical, scapula, and skull. And you can find those in the article of Fabio Scopa and Carla Steco, which it's great because in today's day we have an atlas and she described really beautifully with tons of pictures uh, of uh, her work. Uh, sh showing how the fascia spreads in the whole body. So again, so it's maxilla, so now those patients putting their hands around the neck, that's kind of okay, so let's see how that is being connected. Cervical, the back of the neck, what they are telling us. Scapula, what, what's going on there? And then the scalp. So let's, let's uh, explore together. So anteriorly, we can see the, the, the tongue is connecting with the anterior part of the body, so the hyoid bone, okay? All the hyoid bone, the superior, inferior uh, muscles connecting with the anterior part of the uh, body. Posteriorly, we have the superior and the middle uh, constrictor of pharynx right here. And right there. Actually, if I move, I can highlight it so we can see it really well, okay? So let's go a little bit further. Cranial level, for the cranial level, we have the styloglosses and stylohyoid. So styloglosses, stylohyoid, connecting straight to the skull. At the mandibular level, we have the genioglossal. Genio genioglossus, and then we have the geniohyoid and the mylohyoid connecting to the hyoid bone right there. Now let's look at the fascia. So remember the fascia is covering all those muscles. So we start with the temporal, with the temporal fascia right there. Oops, right there. And the temporal fascia is continuing with the parotidomasseteric fascia. Okay. And this parotidomasseteric is covering the, mas the masseter muscle. 
Now, as you can appreciate in this picture, the masseter muscle connects with the pterygoid medial really tight. So we have, well, where is my point pointer? Okay, so the masseteric, and right under, underneath here, we can see the medial. And then the pterygoid fascia covers the pterygoid uh, medial. So we can see how they connect really close. And then the next step goes to the pterygoid fascia right there with the TMD capsule and bacopharyngeal fascia. That's a vaccinated bacopharyngeal fascia. Uh, co connects with the superior pharyngeal constrictor and attaches to the vaccinator muscle. So pretty much we are talking about all this area connecting together. And vaccinator muscle ends up connecting to the corner of the mouth right here, okay? So that is the channel between the fascia and the muscle connecting the neck, the back of the neck, and the expression of the face, muscles, and fascia. So now let's listen to Robert Schlepp from this. It's a wonderful uh, video. I highly recommend for you to go and uh, watch it. It's called The Secret Life of Fascia. Fascia is described as the muscular connective tissue. But I don't agree to that, because the muscular connective tissue, the muscular envelopes, the tendons, etc., they are continuous with the visceral fascia. For example, particularly the anterior neck muscles are totally continuous with the mediastinum. So you could also do yoga-like stretches in order to loosen up the connective tissue around your heart and your lungs. So that's extremely important to understand how everything connects and goes to the heart, to the visceral, and that's why some patients are telling us they feel here, they feel here, and we get all those subjective analysis, which are a nightmare for Dr. Zaghi, which is a researcher, and that doesn't make sense, right? That's what you are telling me. <laughs> okay. All right. The other element we need to, to take into consideration is compensation. So what is compensation? It is a product of the body performing less than optimal basic functions which forces muscles to execute tasks which they are not designed for. And here I want to share one of my patients. He was not being told, you know, just I said it was our first visit. And let's see how those compensation looks to you. Great. So, ready? Mm -hmm. Let's go and have some fun. Okay. All right. Can you stick your tongue out at me? Can you touch your nose? Can you touch your chin? Can you go sideways like this? The other way. Can you lick your lips? Okay, can you say la 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 la? La 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 la. And ta 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 ta. Ta 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 ta. And na 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 na. Na 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 na. And da 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 da. Da 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 da. Very good. Can you wink on one side? And then the other side. Can you just smell something like? <laughs> okay, thank you. So what do we notice here? There is a totally lack, a totally lack, besides of the inability of moving the tongue, so there is no tongue mobility. Uh, we notice the face. The face is freezed. The middle of the face is freezed. We recognize how he is not able to use the facial uh, muscles. He cannot lift the middle of his cheeks. Um, also, we notice how the floor of the mouth, and then how the, uh, infra high, uh, the in, in, superior and in, inferior hyoid uh, muscles are kind of 
trying to help in that tongue mobility. And it's very common to see a lot of tension on the neck area. Any questions about this? Because this is kind of important for us to understand. No? Yes? Excuse me? Yeah, definitely. I love to. Oops. Let me go there and now. So, ready? Mm -hmm. Let's go and have some fun. Okay. All right. Can you stick your tongue out at me? Can you touch your nose? You see how it brings the jaw forward, right? Can you right? touch your chin? He cannot go up. Can he you go sideways like this? Now the, the other jaw way. moves, the mandibule is more relaxed. Can you lick your lips? There is no licking lips. You okay. See how Can you say la 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 la? La 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 la. I'm looking and for ta, the tongue ta, position. Ta 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 ta. And na 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 na. Na 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 na. And da 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 da. Da 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 da. Very good. The jaw goes Can you up and down. So side. actually, he talks with his jaw, and then not the other using side. the tongue. Can you just smell something like? He can move okay. the nostrils. He you. cannot move the muscles. Okay, did that help? Anybody else, any question? Yes. What is what? Uh, he, he, his complaint was pain and sleep issues. Yeah. Hmm? He, the pain was in the shoulders, in the face, uh, uh, facial pain, not necessarily TMD, you know, but facial pain, uh, migraines, um, lack of sleep. So now let's look at the role of, uh, or, uh, in the oral facial complex impacts on growth and development. So what do we see here? We see a mouth breather, okay, and open mouth posture. We can look at the tongue, uh, that's a um, tongue sucking, uh, tongue thrusting, uh, tongue tie, and buckle ties as well, which is extremely important. Um, forward head and shoulder posture, immature swallowing. Those are factors that we need to look for and to give us an idea how much of the restriction or fascia restriction is there and kind of understand actually those patients need to go to see someone to have work on their body before even starting to do myofunctional therapy or maybe myofunctional therapy is going to help them. And that's why we are here because we want to learn from each other how we can help and how we can bring the best uh, care for our patients. And not to forget the terticollis. Okay. So now remember we're talking about the role of trauma. And trauma can happen even before the baby is born, in, uh, during the pregnancy, can happen at the birth, in, during the birth process. There are all sorts of falls as an infant, as a child, as an adult, uh, broken bones, sports injury, concussion, car accidents, and especially abdominal surgeries because they deal with a lot of cutting of lots of layer of fascia. Okay, and it's creating a lot of scar tissue. So actually what is happening in terms of fascia, right? So what happens, it is that we have the HA, the hyaluronic acid, it's thickening. So instead of being gliding, instead of helping the fascia to have mobility, it's getting stuck. And exactly like in the previous picture presentation, it's getting stuck and kind of puts pressure on the nerves, puts pressure on the muscle, so it's the compensation element starts to kick in, okay? And it's important to understand because on the nerves actually can send the wrong message, the body sending the wrong message to the brain. And the brain thinks it's something different than actually what it is. So 
So, uh, key takeaways. Please, please, please take a really very thorough evaluation. And I know one of the complaints that is, oh, how long should be uh, my, uh, when we have the patients for uh, myofunctional therapy evaluation, that is too long. And you know, in today's days, I understand people want to be in and out really fast. I'm paying for the parking, let, get, let me get out of here. I do have my next uh, um, activity with my child in 30 minutes, can you do it? Please be firm, no. Because if you rush and you do it, you are not able to examine all the elements and then you are going to come with a fast uh, uh, treatment plan and then you set up yourself for failure with that patient. And I feel like especially when patients as adults come with a lot of pain, we need to respect that and to, pay, pay, uh, to, to spend the time to listen to them because if we don't understand where they are coming from, we cannot help them, okay? Just getting through a series of exercises is not going to help. So let's look at the structure. Uh, are they tan tie? Are they uh, buckle tie? Um, is there any issues with the facial development? You know, you look at the bite, you examine the bite, you examine the development of the maxilla, the mandibule, uh, look at the posture. And posture is a funny thing because it can go either under structure, it can go under the function as well. But those are just a few elements extremely important in evaluation. Function, make sure they, can be, uh, they are able to breathe through their nose. Check their sw uh, swallowing and uh, chewing patterns. Look at the reflexes. Behavior. Check for the habits. Are they still sucking their tongue? And guess what? They are adults still sucking their tongue or sucking their uh, uh, fingers. Um, ADD and HDHD. What are the behaviors? And could be adults or uh, children as well. Sleep issues. And uh, here I put a list of um, talking in, in, in to honor the collaboration, which I truly, and that the Breed Institute, we are truly believing in those, uh, in, in this approach. And uh, I put kind of a chart of uh, years, and I took the, the chart, you know, the infants, toddler, children, teens, and adults from the pediatric way, the way the pediatrician are uh, sorting those out. However, from my point of view, I would say when we go about children, I will have another category, I'll be five to seven, eight, because between the three years old and eight years old, that is the most important part of, it's like 80% of the facial development happens. So that is a crucial phase, and that's why it's so important to have those kids examined and to be referred to the appropriate specialist if needed. So who are the people we like to work with? If the child, uh, if it's an infant, definitely will be a lactation consultant, would be a phytic therapist if they are passing six months. And I put their body workers because that's really quite a wide term. And I want to include that this could be a manual therapist. 